In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers, giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working you and my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar. Wow, it's Friday, the weekend's almost upon us. How's your week been? Hopefully you've been productive and focused. So wow, Victoria Pendleton, VP on Cool Conversations last night. What a wonderful woman, huh? God, just gold nuggets all the way through a conversation. For me, the takeaway was that finding your happy place. Uh, my, my happy place normally this time of year is Everest Base Camp, but I can't be there. So I've had to adjust to change and these fields, running these fields, which only a few months ago were my nemesis in the wet and the dirt and the mud. These are my new happy place. So what I took away from last night is we need to adjust and change. 
We need to find that happy place and that's going to elevate us. So remember, this weekend, we're in it together. We'll get through this together. So let's get it done. Well, that's a glorious morning run done. I was thinking about my guest on Cool Conversations next week. Uh, the climber and author, Joe Simpson. A uh, man that wrote the famous book, Touching the Void, Beckoning in Silence, Game of Ghosts, etc. And it just got me thinking, normally I'd be on an expedition about now, and we will be sharing books. So I was curious what your favorite mountaineering book is. It can be from any era, any generation, about anything to do with climbing. i would be fascinated to know what you guys are reading during lockdown. So hit me up here, let me know what your, uh, your faves are, and uh, yeah, perhaps we'll post them early next week. Remember, in it together, we get it done together. Whoa, cold blustery wind this morning, but that's one of my favorite runs that I've just done. Just under 13K of pure joy. Can't think of a better way to start the week. So yeah, between the wind, the chill, and the, the joy of the run, that's me super invigorated for the, uh, at least for the day, if not the week ahead. And that's the, uh, that's the key thing on a Monday. Stay positive, get out there, and get it done. So we enter another week, we're in it together, let's get it done together. Whoa, ho, 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 ho. what an amazing day. Very slight ground frost this morning, still visible in the shadows along the walls, etc. But look at that, blue sky, not a breath of wind and the sun's out. It's gonna be an absolutely glorious one. Gotta catch up on a couple of things today. Many of you were kind enough to send in your mountaineering book suggestions. Some absolute crackers in there. So I'm going to upload the top three or four later on. And if you haven't read them, I highly advise that you jump in, get a copy and digest your way through those because there's some really good ones in there. And then moving forward this week, don't forget the author, Joe Simpson, on uh, Cool Conversations on Thursday. But for now, I'm off to get some coffee. We're in this together. Together, we're gonna get through it. So let's get it done today, guys. Wow, well, stiff 10K just bashed out there through the fields. Beautiful, check that out. Beautiful weather again this morning. A little bit of a breeze. I think there might be a small ground frost. But trying to stay positive and using the exercise for exactly that. It's Wednesday. Sometimes enthusiasm can wane a bit. Certainly putting on the shoes this morning wasn't massively feeling in love, but we were talking to myself and I got out and uh, I got it done. And don't, don't forget, tomorrow night, Cool Conversations, uh, 1800 British Summertime, uh, on YouTube, Twitter, etc., etc., with the Barn Theatre. We have Joe Simpson, climber, author, the man that wrote Touching the Void. Epic read if you've never read it. So hit us up there. Uh, but let me know what you're doing to stay positive right now. I'd love to know what each and every one of you is up to. So remember, we're in this together. We'll get it done together. My mate Kenton has done some extraordinary things in his life and he's pretty hilarious as well. We're going to talk about climbing, we're going to talk about sports, hot topics, and we're going to merge all that together for an entertaining 30 minutes. Good evening and welcome back to Cool Conversations here at the Barn Theatre in Sirencester. Now, today's guest is somebody that I've been really, really pumped about all week. The mountaineer and international best-selling author, Joe Simpson. Now, arguably most famous for the book that he wrote himself about touching the void, the, um, the crisis, the climbing. In fact, instead of telling you about, let's go climbing. You and me right now, let's go climbing. What shall we do? Let's try and do something really special. Let's go down to the Andes, to Peru, and do a new route, a climb that nobody's ever done before. We get there, it's this colossal face, it's just the two of us and a friend that we brought along to look after base camp. We're super remote. 
We've got almost archaic climbing equipment compared with what we have now. And we get on the climb. There's no weather forecast, there's no communication, and we climb up this colossal face into the unknown. And we get to the top, and we're high five and fist bumping and all that sort of thing, but we've got to get down. And as we start to descend, a storm envelops us, and we can't quite see where we're going. We're tired, we've run out of food, and we're now on this treacherous descent on the way down, and I fall. I fall down a little ice cliff and shatter my leg. We're now in the teeth of the, of the storm. And Simon, he's trying to lower me down the hill. You're trying to lower me down the hill. And I'm tied to two, two thin cords of nylon. And we start going down into the unknown. It's getting dark. And I get lowered over an ice cliff. And I'm hanging onto your waist as you get hit by multiple avalanches. And you're sat there for what feels like eternity, and I'm hanging on the rope, not knowing what's going on. And you don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. And then you remember you have a knife on the back of your harness. What do you do? What followed was Joe's fight for his very survival. And that is the premise of the international best-selling book and film, Touching the Void, written by Joe. It's a true story. If you've not read it, pick it up and devour it. And that's who we have on the show tonight. So, Joe, are you there, buddy? Up in, um, I'm here, yeah. Oh, there I'm you are, up in the Peak District. Is it sunny oh, there today? It's gorgeous, lovely, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Now, tell me, Joe, lockdown, because you're in a small village, aren't you, in the peak? Yeah. What, what's been filling your days for the last six, seven weeks? What, 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 you know, what is a day in the life of Mr. Simpson at the moment? <laughs> well, <laughs> in some ways, I've been in lockdown for years, so <laughs> it's never really bothered me in the sense that I work from home, you know, when I'm writing, I'm writing at home, whatever. Um, I'm not really writing right now. I'm supposed to be, but I'm, I'm not. Um, I just fill my time with projects, you know, building stone arches, building gates, building stuff for the garden. They opened the river yesterday, so I went fishing for the first time. Uh, oh, I, I was going to say, a, a very good friend of mine, if she's watching, Beaky, she, she's got the hashtag Be Beaky Fishes. She's a lot better looking than you are, Joe. Uh, <laughs> and, and she was interviewed on... Uh, Radio 4, I think, yesterday morning about the opening up of the rivers. Uh, yep. it, it strikes me as a strange sport to have been banned, so to speak, during lockdown. Because it, it's a fairly solitary sport, is it not? I know nothing about fishing, well, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought it was pretty ridiculous. But there's fishing and fishing, you know. that You could have fishing on stew ponds where everybody sat side by side, fishing for carp or on the side of a canal. But if you're fishing on a, a trout river... It tends to be divided into beats. Our river is divided into beats. Each is a quarter of a mile long. Each has a padlock gate at each end. And the, the irony was, when I went for a walk on the other side of the river between Hathersage and Grindleford, I was dodging pram pushers, dog walkers, joggers, that lot. Looking at our side of the river, there was no one on it, you know. But anyway, they, they decided that they all had to be closed. So, but it opened up yesterday and I went and fished for an hour and a half and caught nine brown trout and lost three so that was a nice start to the season uh, so, so, so which river are you obviously i used to live in sheffield so i know the the area pretty well oh the derwent okay so it's running down from lady bar yeah and it runs right down all we, we've got from lady bar to grindleford so and then the trout uh, forgive me totally naive the trout you pull out do they go back in or do you end up having them for breakfast or how, how does it work no, it's it's a, we're we're going into catch and uh, release now. It, it used to be a heavily stocked river. We'd stock it artificially with rainbows, and and a lot of us just said this is the wrong way of doing it because the rainbows, the triploids, they can't breed. They basically take the spaces of the wild brown trout, and so we've stopped 
stocking. And what's happening is the wild brown trout are coming back in stronger and stronger numbers. And it's it's got a lot of grayling in the river as well. So it's a very, very clean river. It's It was, Trout and Salmon said it was one of the best trout rivers in the whole of England. Uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous river. And, uh, Am I right in thinking that the trout's a fairly aggressive fish? Because they introduced it to Lake Titicaca uh, in Bolivia. And I believe that it's totally overtaken and decimated all the local fish stocks because it's quite an aggressive thing. Or fish. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it would overtake them like that. Uh, you get all sorts of different trout. Trout put into big lakes, they often become what are called lakers, and they become very, very big, and they they will eat other fish and and whatever. Um, interestingly enough, I I fly fished on Lake Titicaca. I went out with some lad in a straw boat, and That's he amazing was throwing place, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic. He was throwing chunks of meat over the side and a big hook, and I was thrashing away with a fly rod. And he thought I was completely mad. He'd never seen fly fishing again. So I used to take a telescopic rope for all the expeditions I went on. So, Oh, did you? Um, yeah, well, if you think about it, the greatest rivers come out of the greatest mountains. So I fished for snow trout in Nepal. You know, I fished in Peru. Uh, when we were filming in Peru, uh, we found a lake near our base camp. Um, well, when we originally... Uh, when they're in 85, we planned to supplement our diet by catching trout because we knew that um, uh, the lakes had been seeded with trout and uh, uh, as a source of protein for the locals. Uh -huh. But our lake, which was in front of the moraines, didn't have anything in it. But when we went back to film 18 years later, I found a little lake, only 30 minutes walk away, and it was actually stuffed full of trout. I caught about 15 trout in wow. half an hour. I mean, and, I mean but, the film crew ate that lot, and so, yeah. Because it, it's quite interesting, you, you mentioned the reed boats on Lake Titicaca, because uh, I go there with clients quite a lot on the Bolivian side, and apparently that's where Thor Heidel got a lot of his information about the, the reed boats that he then sailed across the Pacific. Quite, Is that the Contiki thing, yeah? E ex exactly, yeah. and there, there's a yeah, place they, they still make in the them. past. They still make them in exactly the same way, and... Uh, but he just upscaled it in a, in a, in a sort of huge way. Yeah. And he just made it. It was sinking by the time it got to the end. Yeah, it, be, it became saturated, didn't it? And it was all yeah. pulled to pieces. <laughs> I mean, that's properly out there. It makes climbers look a little bit uh, pedestrian in their sense of adventure. Uh, yeah, and that was before GPS, little or no radio contact. Yeah. You know, it's not like they could call somebody up for help. No, I imagine he'd be properly out there on his, on his own. I mean, that's... Uh, that's pretty out there in terms of adventure. Now, but one of the things that I've, I've, I've been intrigued myself, so I have to say to the viewers, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna hijack this myself. Because when I first started climbing, obviously your books were, were pretty much everywhere, and they still are, uh, which is um, um, you know, amazing. And it was The Game of Ghosts, um, which you wrote, and I think it's one of the best climbing books. I know it's really sad, it's, it's, a lot of it is based upon friends of yours that died. Yeah. Um, just, just talk me through what the, you know, what the vision or the goal of that book was. You'd already written Touch and Avoid, and this was almost like a follow-up, was it not? Well, yeah, look, I, I wrote Touch and Avoid, and um, I wrote it in seven weeks. Seven uh, weeks? Yeah, right. in the attic of uh, John Stevenson's house. And um, you've got to remember, at that time, I, I had no intention of being an author, I uh, had no idea I could even write a book, let alone you know, what, what it turned out to be. And so I, I, I wrote Void, and um, I had a wonderful editor called Tony Colwell, and we got, got it published through Johnson Cave. Anyway, long story of it, the, it, it sold very slowly initially, and it just gradually sort of did a word of mouth thing. And it was people like John's mother who was reading it, and her friends are reading it. And I suddenly realized there were lots of people who who were not climbers who were reading this book. And then it just took off and, and won all these awards and whatever. And at that point, I got quite scared because I was thinking, God, you know, what have I produced here? Because I didn't, you know, I thought if it had sold 500 copies, I'd have thought, fantastic. You know? And then I thought, well, look, I, I quite enjoyed this writing process. I found it quite scary. I found it challenging. And, and so, so I wanted to write... Um, this Game of Ghosts. I'd always thought about writing This Game of Ghosts, you know, which is, it, the idea is when you read Void, you have no idea where me and Simon came from, what happened to us afterwards, mm. uh, what our climbing culture was, you know, and um, 
so I, that's what I wanted to write. And then I, I wrote a novel called The Water People just to see if I could write. Yeah. And there's some very good writing in it, but it's actually a pretty flawed book. Well, I was going to say, I, I, I've got to confess, I've read it and I, I yeah, like to say it's, it's crap, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want well, to be yeah, really rude, it, but I, I yeah, struggled my not, way through it. What it did is it proved to me I could write, let's put it that way. I just, it was very flawed. I, I'll totally admit that. My, my other novel, much years later, The Sound of Gravity, is, is much, much better. and I'm quite proud of that. So anyway, that was the reason. I, and I, I wanted to explore this, this notion of not um, why do we climb, because um, everyone climbs for their own reasons and for all sorts of different reasons and, and whatever. Uh, but I sort of thought, well, if I explain why I was climbing, you know, maybe it give certainly non-climbing readers some idea of where we were at. And it was also a very, very interesting generation of the 80s where... You know, it, uh, it very much, you know, I think it was Ryan Old Mesner gave his clarion call of, you know, it's it's got to be uh, Alpine style, you know, in the Greater Ranges. And everyone said, yeah, great idea. And then they all went off and died like flies. You know, I mean, the yeah. cream British mountaineering was killed. <laughs> yeah, know, they, in about the space of 10 years. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, God knows what happened to the Czechs and the Poles and, but everybody went off and did it. And it was this idea of, it was the breaking away from the Himalayan hero idea of these big expeditions and, you know, uh, multiple teams, multiple camps, and the idea of doing routes like that. Um, but it had an, an attrition that went with it, which was essentially at the end of the book, you're saying, well, you know, I, I worked it out 25 years, 25 people who were friends of mine or I uh, knew very well had died. And that's like one a year. Yeah. You know, if you're playing golf and you're using a golfing cart over a year, you'd stop climbing, you'd not stop playing golf, wouldn't you? So, no, you so it said a lot about climbing and it said a lot about what climbers who who, who were really trying to push things uh, were, how committed they were. Mm. You know, it, it wasn't just sticking a flag in a sop of something and high altitude willy waving or anything like that. It was actually, it said a lot more about mountaineers and mountaineering in general. That was, that was the philosophy. Good, good, the, the, the book, I, I read it many, many years ago. The book essentially finishes with Brendan dying, doesn't it? Brendan Murphy. Yeah, uh, in, in Bang. In Chiang yeah. Bang in 97, I think. Now, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting because obviously climbing was such a significant part of your life when you were younger. And now, due to various reasons, You've taken a complete step back from climbing, haven't you? You know, your body's essentially yeah. pieces pieces over, overuse well, was, and injuries, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, there's the, uh, you know, there's a sort of, people often ask me about, you know, you know, have you got any regrets? And you say, well, everybody's got regrets. But I do regret. You know, what, what Peru did to me, you know, was I never really climbed like that again. Um, I, something up here, some level of commitment had gone. And... You know, what I would have loved to have done would be, uh, I mean, my great hero in climbing is, is Mick Fowler. Mm. You know, if I could have done one of Mick Fowler's routes, I, I'd just be happy as hell. I mean, he just does these amazing routes that are aesthetically gorgeous to look at, are done in the most fantastic style. Uh, but, but, but he's you know, I, I, think, I think he's the greatest British mountaineer we've ever had, to be honest. Yeah, but he's uh, relentless. I don't know where he finds them. Uh, but, and then yeah, he, he, he just gets to the top. I mean, look at Spantec, the golden pillar on Spantec. Yeah, Is beautiful. there a more spectacular line anywhere in the world? Yeah, and it, it, I think, so, you know, it, when I went off to Peru, if I had some idea of what I wanted to do in climbing, it was that. Mm. Um, it was something like that, you know. And, of course, it never, that never happened, really. Uh, but I did go climbing. I climbed till uh, 2009, and... Um, I had another accident in 91 with Mal Duff when and he fell off and dragged me off and I, I destroyed my left ankle. Yeah, very, that, that was in Peru, uh, not Peru, that was in Nepal, Marchamo was it? Or the, the mountain? Pachamo, Pachamo, Pachamo yeah. yeah. And um, as I said of the fall, you know, I was, I was entering Nepal, but rather faster than I planned, <laughs> uh, entering Tibet. Anyway, uh, what happened in the end is that I, I went in 2009 to climb on the south side of the trekking peak called Mira. Yeah, and uh, I went with Ray Delaney, and when we got there, there was quite a threatening serac on the route, and Ray didn't want to do it, and I thought I was fit enough and I could solo it. I don't like soloing really, but I soloed it, and I sat on the top, and the view from the top, you know, you could see Everest and Lhotse and Makalu, and just all these eight thousand meter peaks, and I just sat there and thought, I've got three days of agony coming downhill on this knee. And uh, I decided then I, I can't do this anymore because I've got I've got a damaged lower back, ruptured uh, disc in my lower back. I've damaged C6, T1 in my neck. 
I've damaged my right knee and my left ankle. And basically, it's just, I'm now 60, and it's all come home to roost. You, you kind of, you kind of so like I a, sold all my gear in Kathmandu and, and you, never climbed again. So, I mean, you're kind of like a... Um... Uh, surgeon's wet dream, aren't you? I mean, there's so, there's so much of you that's been busted up over the years. But it's really interesting. You touched upon a couple of points. Um, you're talking about when you went down to Peru and you never climbed like that again. And I, I can really, that really resonates with me because I went with Ian Parnell, an American, to Annapurna 3. And we really pushed the boat out on that, for us at least, mentally and physically. And I've never climbed like that since then. And was that with Nick Fikas and uh, No, 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 no. So, so we yeah. were trying to uh, southwest. It's the same mountain, but they were around, yeah, yeah. around this side. We were around another side. And it, it just took us, all, all of us, somewhere which I don't really want to revisit. And yeah. I, I think I was the same. I, I, I came into climbing just after you, I suppose, or, or a little while after you, but I had the same mentality. I wanted to go to the Himalayas. I wanted to emulate some of the, the McIntyres, etc. Yeah. And then when I actually did it, I think I realized that actually you need to be somebody really quite special to continue but, to be able to do that. Well, I think, you, yeah, you have to be. I, I think you also got to, you're, you're riding in luck to a certain degree, you know, because a lot of these friends of mine had died, you know, they, they were really good climbers. Well, no, you know? they, they were some of the best they, in the world. Just, you know, and nearly, not, not a single one of them died because they fell off. Yeah. They died because of factors that were completely out of their control. Often it was high altitude mountain sickness, actually, but avalanches as well. And, um, yeah, there were, the, I, I totally get that. I mean, um, I would have liked to have seen a bit more of what I could have done, um, but I, I, I did wonder, I remember, I remember at one point, um, actually on Cedar Grand, when we were in, on the top, and I was thinking, wow, we've done this. Wow, this is quite a serious route. And it was a serious route. I mean, people underestimate that route. But, but when, is, is it not still unrepeated? Uh, well, Carlos Bula and Mike Price, Carlos Bula is one of the best oh, well, alpine he, style yeah. mountaineers. But, but, but he, he went it off to one side. He, he avoided the main difficulties, did he not? Well, he did, he did the bottom two thirds. And then he did a variation on the top, and he renamed he named his route avoiding the, avoiding touch, the yeah. touch. I thought that was brilliant, but, actually. <laughs> but there's a there's a big difference. But, I mean, that was 17 years later, and 17 years is a lot of time in climbing, in, in development of you know people climbing at higher standards, better equipment, whatever. They still took the same amount of time that we took to climb the mm. face, and they had the the option, and which they never went to the summit. We went to the summit. They they just abseil the whole face on Ab Ablakov threads. Yeah. Well, we didn't have, we only had six ice screws in 1985, and there were snarks that you had. Yeah, they were, they were probably utterly crap, weren't they? Snarks. Yeah, and after the first the day, we couldn't have abseiled off the face. We had to climb out. So, you know, the, the, we then had to come down the North Ridge, and the accident happened. But, um, yeah, I, I did think, I remember thinking on the summit, thinking, bloody hell, we've done this. <laughs> and then thinking, well, what do we do next? You know, do we have to do something harder? <laughs> well, 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 you well, wonder, well, I'm in this horrible spiral. Yeah. Well, well, that, that's it. And uh, Ian Parnell, uh, who I climbed with for many, many years, he gave up Himalayan climbing because of exactly that. It started to get higher and higher and lighter and oh, faster, no. et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And he said, no, I, I've got to take a step back. I've got a family and yeah. I can't do this anymore. But An Annapurna 3 was, was, was a... Uh, Nasty mountain. I mean, Nick Kikas went on this trip with friends of ours with Rob Utley, and Rob Utley died. Yeah, on that. He, he died he on, on the East Ridge, didn't he? And you know, it just did add up after a while. You know, I mean, if you if you told us someone like Scott or Bonington, they all have lost thirty uh, plus people. Yeah. The, the, the there's no there's, yeah. no there's no there's no other sport or occupation in the world that does that. Well, well, it was it was only, uh, um, well, and we're not stupid. No, so. no, we're not stupid. But but it was Ernest Hemingway said that there's only three sports in the world and that's mountaineering bullfighting and motor racing the rest are merely games and well, he, boxing i'd include boxing i'd say yeah it? B -b potentially. and he was a keen he wrote a lot about boxing i'm surprised he didn't put that in because because one of the factors of if you look at motor racing boxing and climbing people die mm. yeah in in the 50s and 60s a, a, a major a Formula One racer would die every race or every other race. Oh, the, the attrition. And again, yeah. even even uh, with the Brits, uh, I forget what the yeah. names are. Now, the, the three or four amazing Brits in Formula One, they all died in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. 
absolutely. And and mountaineering has a has a renowned death rate, and boxing does. It's not on the same level, but there's something about boxing which has has got writers to write at an incredibly high standard. It, it, mountaineering has has created some great mountaineering literature, unlike golf, <laughs> and um, you know so has boxing. Hemingway used to write about boxing because because it was the notion of uh, believing so much in your ability to do something that you were prepared to risk your life in that belief. When a boxer steps into the ring, you know, he could die, but he still thinks he's good enough to carry on. When a climber stands at the bottom of her face, like Annapurna III or Sue Grand, it's not arrogance or ego, it's actually a supreme self-confidence. You believe that you're good enough to do this thing and you have earned the right to be there. And that is something quite exceptional. That's something that you couldn't say about football, you know, or cricket or, you know, well, actually facing a Malcolm Marshall bouncer <laughs> might be quite dangerous. But do you know what I mean? You know, if, I always said about mountaineering, if you took death out of it, it wouldn't be the same thing. Because it's, death defines it and it, it gives it um, a validity and intensity that is absolutely exceptional because... This is John willingly understanding the risks accepted. And I think that's extraordinary. Mm. And so when you see some of the great climbers like Kurtika and stuff like that, you just you're just in awe of them. You're just yeah. in awe of what, what they're doing, yeah. you know. It, and then it, you're so sad because you lose so many of them. It, it, it was uh, Pritchard's first book, Deep Play. Um, he stole that off me. Oh, did he? I, I was going to say, you, you, you must know the meaning of the term deep play. It's where it's Jeremy one... Benson, he, who's this Christian uh, lecturer guy, uh, it's it, it's related to gambling, and it's so deep play is where you uh, um, what what you stand to win is far less than anything you could possibly lose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I told I, this I, to I, Paul. I, love that. Tell me, I, 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 I didn't know he got it from you, but I mean, Paul himself had an horrific accident yeah. doing something which you would have thought for him right. was relatively yeah. benign. Uh, well, when you think people. of the routes he did on Gogarth, yeah, I mean, some of those are just death routes. All of yeah. them are loose rock, you know. And he walked away. Yeah, but that's that's one of those shit up moments, isn't it? You know, yeah, if, totally. if a single rock comes down, look at Alex McIntyre. Yeah. He's yeah. on the south face of Annapurna. It's uh, what ten thousand feet high. There's three human beings on this enormous face, and a single stone comes down yeah. and hits him on the back of the neck. Yeah. It could have hit him anywhere, but it hit him on the back of the neck. No, it's, it's, it's incredible. No. So, so, so one of the questions I really wanted to put to you, and, and I didn't realise it was a moment of almost epiphany on top of Mera Peak, where you realised, actually, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. You were deeply invested in the community of climbing. So when you walked away from it, you know, did, did you feel that loss of community in some manner? Or, or, or did you yeah, stay I, well, connected I, to it? I, you know, I, I'd been thinking about it for a while, you know, I just couldn't put up with the pain anymore, you know, and it's, you know, just painkillers rattling in the top back of your rucksack. And, the, and I knew that there was going to come an end someday. And I thought, well, look, it doesn't get much better than this, soloing a new route in, in the Himalayas, let's stop now. And all my reasons and logic were fine, but my emotions weren't. And I, for five years, it was like a grief. I, I still get turned over if I'm watching the news and I see some some Sherpas or some shot of Nepal, I just go, oh, get waves of nostalgia. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I missed it. I was shocked how much I missed it because you know as well, it, you, you know, I'd, if somebody said, what are you? I'd say I'm a mountaineer. Yeah. Like, clearly I'm not, I don't climb mountains, but I identify myself as a mountaineer because I've spent my entire adult life doing it. And, and it's more like a lifestyle than a, a mm. sport. Yeah. You, you've hit it absolutely on the head. It's a lifestyle. Absolutely. And I think one of the driving forces, because I, I had not quite on the same scale as you, but I, I had a pretty bad accident in my early 20s. I fell off rock climbing, smashed both my legs up, and I was told I'd never walk without a stick. And they always tell you that. Well, yeah. And, and, and it was the threat of losing the lifestyle. That's yeah. what got me back up on those parallel bars. And a year of constantly falling over and the pain and the tears and the heartache until I could do it again. And it was such a powerful driving force. 
Uh, and it oh, came yeah, back to, absolutely. to the lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, when, when um, you see, when I broke my knee in, in Nepal, in Peru, I, I didn't really know anything about knees at that point. I didn't know how serious this thing was, you know, and um, what it was is a tibial plateau fracture. And um, I've only since learned uh, that with 80% of tibial plateau fractures, you rupture your popliteal artery and you bleed out. Jeez. And I, mine didn't rupture, thank God. Wow. But anyway, um, it was only when I got home and I had this big operation. I had an operation in Peru that I allowed to happen because I didn't know what I was doing. And then, then I had five more in, in Britain and the consultant, the orthopedic consultant was, was basically saying, you know, uh, you'll never walk without a limp. You'll never have more than five degrees of bend in your knee. You'll never climb again, you know, whatever. It just, just dismissed me basically. And I can remember I'd been nine months in plaster Oh. And they took this final plaster off. And I remember sitting on the edge of the side of the bed and the muscle loss was so bad that it, I didn't look like I had a thigh. I just had a bone with skin on it with these really long black hairs on it. And I just burst into <laughs> tears. I, I burst into tears because I actually believed them. I thought, Jesus, I'm not, I'm not ever going to get out of this. And it took a year of falling over and physio and just forcing it and forcing it and forcing it. And it was exactly the same reason as you said. Because he said you can't do it. Yeah, yeah it's thought, exactly the same. Yeah, sod it. I, I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, it's you know? exactly the same. Um, and, it, and it was the community. It, it was yeah. the fear of the loss of friends or being able to go down the pub or the, you know, Friday evenings at Stanage or, or whatever it may be. Uh, it was but it was also, it was also the, you know, what I really miss was, uh, wasn't just the climbing. Um, it, it was that sense of adventure. You know, when you got an airplane, you're speeding off down the, mo the, the runway and you're thinking, oh my God, here we go again. What's going to happen this time? This is going to be wild. And that, that adventure of going off with mates and having a great crack. And sometimes you just didn't climb anything because you just got, crapped out by the weather or you've got avalanche or something, you know, and you come home, but you'd have great stories to tell. And I have more memories of the crack we used to have than I do of the actual climbing. Yeah, yeah. You know? the, the climbing is almost irrelevant. It is, I... it is. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, what well, you know, and, and that's what I miss, actually. I miss the fact that, see, mountaineering to me wasn't simply about going and climbing mountains. It, you, you only spend about 20% of your time climbing the damn mountain. The other time you're traveling, you're interacting with locals, you're dealing with people. They might be Hindu, they might be Buddhist, they might be Muslim, they might be Christian. They're inevitably in the mountains, incredibly poor. They're also inevitably, because they're poor, incredibly generous and hospitable. And your life changes when you when you witness this, you know. And you you your life, your mind is broadened, and you get home, and you look around, and you go. Oh, I'm never going to complain about my life. Yeah. You know, I, you know, you, you just think the poorest person in Britain is the richest creases compared to some Bolivian peasant up on the Altiplano. And that changed your whole outlook on life and, and what was important, you know. Yeah, I, I talk about exactly that a lot. I get back to Heathrow from a trip and more often than not, I'm disappointed with what I see in the UK yeah. uh, and the society we've we, we're, we're, we're part of the capitalist society that we're in, which is about the individual rather than the collective. Uh, you, you, you've just said that we, we come in contact with these people who have almost nothing, yet they are some of the most generous people I've ever met. And I've never quite worked out, well, maybe because they have nothing and they need to share. Uh, it's, well, there's it it two things that struck me really strongly. That the first time was when I, when I went to Peru with Simon, and we had this Irero, this donkey guy who, who um, who's called Spinoza, and uh, uh, each night we'd stop, we'd put up our little uh, Gore-Tex tent, and he'd sit beside a rock with a poncho on his head. You know, we'd say, come and join us in the tent. He wouldn't join us in the tent. He just sat down with a poncho over him. And then anyway, uh, later on, when we got to base camp and he, he was hanging around and he was eyeing our climbing ropes. And he obviously thought this would be great for the burrows, you know, for the donkeys. And we just didn't know how to tell him because he was out of the money economy. He was in the barter economy. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't say, look, this rope's worth $150 because he couldn't even conceive of that amount of money. You know, and while he was sitting under a poncho, 
we were in a sleeping bag worth about 200 quid. There's just no way we could explain to him that we were using these things to have fun. You know, and I, I remember crossing the Nang Pilar when I was going to Choyo with Mal in, in uh, 1990, 91. And uh, there I was in sort of foot to head Gore-Tex, you know, and fancy goggles on my head. And these bunch of refugees come past us. They're escaping from Tibet. From t- you know? Tibet, they, yeah. They were, yeah, and there were these kids there who were about 14 and they were in tracksuit trainers and they had these Chinese sort of... Uh, pumps, gym pumps on yeah. at 19,000 feet, and two of them were snow blind. Right. You know, and you but, thought, I just actually felt really guilty. I was stood there thinking, I've just come here to have fun. These guys are escaping from something. Yeah, and, 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 and that went nothing. on for a year. I mean, I was there in 96 with, uh, not 96, 2006 with Henry Todd, and there were still trains of refugees coming across, and 2006, the Chinese army got involved, and, th- and then they shot... Yeah. They shot a monk there. We were actually on, on the mountain, but heard all the gunfire. Uh, because, I mean, for, for centuries, that's been a trading route between yeah, yeah. Uh, t- Tibet and, uh, and Nepal. So, so, so were you, I presume you were going from Nepal to the Chinese side or the Tibetan side to then climb the... Yeah, you, the, could, you can climb Choyu from the Nepalese side, but you, at the Nang Pilar, you, you're, you're crossing into... Into uh, Tibet. China, but you yeah. can still climb it from that side, and yeah. we had the permit to do it. Mal had done it. God knows how Mal did it, but Mal did lots of very, Well, he probably very, did it illegally, I suspect. Uh, well, Mal also, and this is the only time I got altitude sickness, actually. Um, we, we got a base camp. Everything was going fine. And I usually acclimatise quite quickly, and by then I had a sense of, you know, you get a sense of how you acclimatise. And uh, we were like, walking up towards the Nang Pilar and up towards uh, Camp One. And I just felt uh, something's not working here. You know, I, I just seemed to be running on three cylinders, you know. And I was really quite concerned, but I, I, didn't, I didn't have enough. I wasn't coughing and whatever. I just felt that there was something wrong. Anyway, it got a bit worse that evening. And I said to Mal, I said, I think I've got something wrong here. I've got to get out of this. And Mal's attitude was, no, 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 tough it out, tough it out, you'll be fine. <laughs> and I, thank God, I just ignored him. And I got up in the middle of the night and I started walking and I walked from, from there all the way to Sami, which is just outside um, Namchi. Wow. In, wow. One, in one long walk. God, that's bloody miles. Yeah, yeah, it's miles. But when I got to, uh, when I got, before I got to Sami, so I don't know how, how many hours I was walking bloody ages, 14 hours and something stupid. Anyway, when I got outside Tammy, I was coughing like crazy. And all this white fluid was coming up. Wow. And I told Tat, Ian Tatsell, his doctor, who I climb in a lot, and he said, yeah, you have an incipient pulmonary. Wow. And if I, if I listened if to my body, stayed, I didn't listen to bloody mouth. Anyway, if you stayed oh, there, you probably would have died. That's or, exactly it. Or, or, or potentially. Yeah. So, I mean, that used to scare me more than anything. I mean, I, I, used, to, I used to just be really haunted by Rob Utley's death, you know. Because Nick had to leave him in the end to save his own life, and he was left alone in the you know, dying world. Al, Al Rouse on K2 as well. Well, I mean, the, 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 the list is, is yeah. endless. I mean, you, you, you wrote that many of them in your book. It's a particularly insidious thing, you know, uh, high altitude sickness, the way it gets you. And, and I, I, I think I was more paranoid about it, and that's why I ran down. And I did the right thing, I think. You know. Yeah. And, and, it, and the, the thing, I mean, so some of the viewers perhaps don't know the power of, of you know, high altitude cerebral or pulmonary edema, but it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how fit you are, it, it, once it strikes, you are, you know, it's a ticking time bomb. Uh, and well, I mean, so, you know, I've always been used to say to me, if you come down with an incipient pulmonary in the evening, uh, one thing you don't do is go to sleep because that depresses uh-huh. your respiration. You stay awake all night. The first thing you try and do is lose a couple of thousand feet in height. So if you can't do any of those things, in all likelihood, you may be in a coma by the morning. You could be dead by the afternoon. Yeah. You know, uh, it, unless you've got some really powerful steroidal things that you can take. You know, if you haven't got those. But, 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 but it, even the steroids, just I mean, we should move on. It's quite morbid. But, but even even the steroids are all they do is delay it. I was involved with trying yeah. to um, rescue a Taiwanese climber on yeah. Everest, pump, pumping him full of dexamethasone and using yeah. uh, using everything. Um, and we kept him alive almost through the night. 
but he died in the early hours. Um, yeah, but you, you can losing heights really the only thing you can do. I mean, all you're doing is they're massive diuretic, diuretics, basically. That's yeah. what they're doing. And and you know, if you could if you could have lost height, then then it would have been really effective. But if you can't lose height, you, you're, I mean, I remember Tat saying, if you're taking knees, you're in such deep shit, you might as well kill yourself. <laughs> He was no, a doctor. Absolutely. So, 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 so what have you replaced the, the lifestyle with? I mean, you've got your fishing, and I know you're, you're big into your cricket. Uh, you say, you, you say, it sounds like you build a lot. Uh, you, you clearly write a lot, because that's what you're known as, you know, a multiple yeah. award, best, international best-selling author. And, and your writing, I think, is brilliant, by the way. Uh, so, I mean, is, is that what you replaced the, life, the climbing lifestyle with? No, you can't replace it, you know. Uh, I did a whole bunch of fairly serious paragliding for a bit, and then I realised, well, actually, I'm probably going to break my legs doing this. Actually, so. <laughs> but it's, I, I think I learned, I, I knew that you can't replace it, and if you do, you're just going to you're just going to be chasing your tail. You just you just be grateful for what you had. I had a fantastic crack at it and all that. But I mean, I, you know, um, I just, yeah, I'm, I. I wrote a novel called uh, Walking Alongside the Grass, which is the first novel I've written that's got nothing to do with climbing. And it's about a, a young lad in a, in a Derbyshire village who, who ends up in the trenches of the First World War. It's a love story. It's a, a revenge story, whatever. And I think it's the best thing I've ever written. Uh, but one of the reasons I wrote it, because I, I didn't write it to make a living, I wrote it because I love writing, is um, I found writing as challenging um, and as scary, in fact, more scary than climbing, you know, uh, did, 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 because did, 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 I just to explain that a little bit. But well, well, why is it so scary? I mean, I've written a book. My book is definitely uh, not in the same league as yours at all, because you're, you're writing, as I said, it, I think it's very good. And this is your new book you're, you're, you're talking yeah. about now. Well, what makes it so scary? Well, the, the, one is... It's scary from your point of view because, say, for instance, okay, I'm, I'm, I've deliberately made it uncomfortable myself because I'm not, I've, I'm, I've moved away from my comfort zone. I'm not writing about mountaineering or climbing or, or of any sort. So you're, you're scared and you're thinking, you know, you know, can I do this? You know, can I be a novelist? Can I be a novelist outside? I mean, The Sound of Gravity was a novel that I wrote, which I thought was pretty good. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> That's the first time this happened on Cool Conversations. I've got to high five you for that one. Brilliant. I love it. It's probably your anyway. publicist saying, come on, where's the manuscript? Oh, we've lost Joe. Have we lost Joe? Well, there we go. I think we upset Joe so much by... Um, uh, by taking the piss out of his... Oh, he's back again. There we are. No, I'm back. Oh, I'm back. Thank goodness. It's my wife trying to ring me. She's in a garden centre. She probably wants to, to know what I'm <laughs> looking for. But well, well, getting back to that, the other, the other scary thing is that it's going to be published. You know, and if you really care about what you're doing, you know, you, this is your baby you're creating and it's something you've put all your effort in and, and all your... Uh, everything that you can and then you've got to give it to people to read and, and they can hate it and just go, they want a load of crap. And there's nothing you can do about it. But, 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 but that makes you vulnerable in a way that climbing doesn't. Like, you know, you never climb in front of other people, and, and if you fail to get up this hill, they all went, oh, that's crap, you're useless. Whereas in writing, it, it was very public and very... It made you feel vulnerable. And, uh, but, but, but it made then, me feel vulnerable. Uh, do, do, do you read the uh, reviews of your books? Yeah, sometimes. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I, I deliberately didn't read any reviews for the book that I wrote. Uh, be because I suppose retrospectively looking at it, I, I think I was fearful about what no, people would good. say. Well, look, I've got I've got two reviews here for the Water People, right? Which I personally think was a very flawed book with a, some good writing yeah. in it, but it was really badly put together. The one review for the hardback says it's a brilliant book. The, the review for the paperback in the same newspaper a year later says it's absolutely crap. Really? And I've got it here just to remind me. <laughs> so, you know, same, you got to remember the review. Paper. I love that. Yeah, but a review is only another individual's opinion. Yeah. You know, there'll be a book I'll love, and if you read it, you'd hate it. You know, there's the, so you, you shouldn't get so upset about it. But, I mean, I had a review of um, uh, this game of Ghost, and uh, this bloke in The Guardian or something, I think it was, and, and he said, um, uh, I'd, 
I had rewritten the state of uh, British masculinity. <laughs> oh, what the fuck are you talking about? What book have you read? You know, it's just really bizarre. I just <laughs> didn't get it at all. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think so much that I'm, I was talking about reviewers. I think it was just generally, you're giving this thing out as a piece of work. So, so the, bit, the, the best bit in writing is in the middle. The, the, it's difficult to start with a blank page. When you're in the middle, you're really enjoying it. When you get to the end, you have this awful, sickening feeling. Oh God, I've got to give this to other people now. And do I really want to do that? So, huh. uh, and, and, and when's the book uh, due to be published? Is, is it out already, or is it? Is yeah, it... Uh, the trouble is, I um, had a massive falling out with Random House with my publishers because oh, they, they they wanted to steal all my e rights off me, uh, and and I just thought. Then they tried to bully me, and I just thought I'm not having this. So. I set up a digital publishing company and I printed the whole of my, my backlist myself. Um, uh, but I can't get a print publisher anymore. So uh, I released Walking the Wrong Side of the Glass. It's on Amazon, it's on Kindle. Okay. And I presumably if I start the next novel, that will be the same, unless we can get a print publisher. But, uh, so so, so, so you, you just said there, when I start the next novel. So there's another one in the pipeline already. Yeah, it's a really long pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> you see, what, what I do when I'm about to, to, uh, to write something is I, I start doing the most amazing deflective things. Like I suddenly need to dig a 20-foot pond that's five foot deep by hand. No other reason. But that, I can't possibly start the book now. <laughs> so I'm at the stage where I'm planning it and I've, I've got the story in my head and I, I should really just start writing but I'm, I'm in that cowardly space at the moment and uh, I'll, I'll get around to it. Uh, and how many books is it now? Is it, uh, I mean six? Eight. Seven? Eight. 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 Five non-fiction, three novels, right. one, one non-mountaineering novel. Huh. So. Brilliant. And um, I, I'm very conscious of your time Joe I, but I've got to ask you I remember seeing you numerous times uh, down the Broadfield in Sheffield <laughs> playing pool particularly badly. And I was a brilliant snooker player. What are you talking about? And I, uh, we played you once at St. Gov in St. Govan's Inn in Pembroke. Oh, yeah. Going back, I don't know, at 25 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Um, do, do you still play pool badly? No, well, I, I used to go every Tuesday back to Sheffield and play with my mates, you know, for a couple of hours, but I, I don't bother anymore. But <laughs> I never played badly, Kenton. I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd have wiped the floor with you, mate. No, well, I think I had a young spunker with me who eight balled you. And then he arrogantly went up to you and said, because, of course, you know, you were such a recognisable face. I uh, forget what the guy's name was. He came up to you and cheekily said, uh, just remember, there's no voids to be touched here which I think was, uh, you probably heard a thousand times. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so listen, I, I, I've got to bring this ship home because you've got to go out and build a, a wall or plant some flowers or go fishing for some trout or something like that. Um, I did want to say thank you uh, for your time. Um, really you. insightful. Uh, it really, really is. It, it's filled me with a joy and an even better understanding about why, why I do climb and why you climb yeah. and the importance of, of the community, not necessarily the act yeah. itself. And, uh, yeah, and, it, and despite all the, all the tragedies and whatever, you know what? It was always about having fun. And, and I never had so much fun in my life climbing. It was just brilliant, you know. I don't Joe, regret any of it. Though. Joe, I, I can't say it with greater clarity. Thank you. <laughs> it's about having fun. Thanks, Joe. Wow, that was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Well, there was loads in there. I, I'm pumped about trying to get out climbing again. Not for the act of climbing, but to be part of the community that Joe was alluding to. Now, um, he mentioned uh, all his books, his new novel, which you can find uh, on Amazon, etc., etc. But I do need to take a moment to thank all the viewers and listeners that a few weeks ago very kindly bought my own book with all the proceeds going to the Barn Theatre. Uh, I sold them all out. Uh, we have been in contact with the publisher to try and get some more. But a massive thank you 
to each and every one of you who has donated to the Barn Theatre, Save Our Barn, because that is, after all, what we are doing the cool conversations for. Next week, we have an, um, another amazing guest. I can't tell you who it is yet because we're keeping it top secret. Basically, we don't know. Um, but uh, trust me, it's going to be another amazing, amazing episode of Cool Conversations. So the only thing left for me to say is thank you for each and every one of you for tuning in. Thank you for anybody that has donated to Save Our Barn at the Barn Theatre. And we see you back here, same time, next week. Thanks. In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Arab in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working at UN, my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar.